Alright. We'll go ahead and get started. Again. Alright, so I'm Brian Mann. Uh, I am a full stack web developer here in Atlanta who loves JavaScript. Today I'm going to be talking to you about testing. And more importantly, about testing the way it should be. So I've been a web developer for a while now. I've had a chance to build numerous apps. And along the way, I've used many different tools and worked with many different developers. While building these apps, I've watched and coached new developers into the world of testing. But testing is essential, and we should all know that. We absolutely need to do it to ensure that we develop quality software. Testing drives the design of our code, it prevents regressions, and it can ultimately lead to higher productivity. But at the same time, let's be honest, it's incredibly difficult. And often, companies and developers invest significant resources into testing, only to ultimately abandon it. And this, to me, is the worst case scenario. So I have thought really hard about this problem, and I have done a lot of research. So I'm going to tell you a story about why I think the tools of testing present these unnecessary challenges and how I'm determined to fix them. So three years ago, I started a screencast series called Backbone Rails. Now, the screencast series detailed building modern applications using Backbone.js and Ruby on Rails. And up until this point, I had only worked with peers within the organization that I worked for. But after producing this series, I got to communicate, teach, consult with developers all over the world. Thousands of developers went through Backbone Rails, and the free videos online received over 100,000 views. And while this series covered many topics, the one detail that was omitted was testing. And naturally, because of this omission, this was the question most asked. Every few days, a developer would email me and wonder what my approach was, was to, uh, to testing. And my answer would go something like this. So you've essentially got two tiers of testing. Arguably, you could add end-to-end -end testing as a third tier. But for the moment, let's just group end-to-end -end tests into the integration test bucket. All right, so we've got unit tests, which focus on a single unit of work, such as the return value of a single function given a specific set of parameters. And this is what we refer to when we talk about testing in isolation, because this function is tested without introducing any other variables or dependencies. And for the most part, unit testing is pretty well figured out. It's really the same no matter what backend technology or language that you're working with. I mean, it is a bit more difficult to unit test client-side JavaScript, but it's still pretty digestible. Integration testing, on the other hand, conceptually means testing the interaction of multiple subsystems or components. So in this example, we're using integration tests to automate the actions of a browser and verify that when interacting with Google's website, we can perform a search and verify that the proper text appears. And what that's doing is that's te testing the integration points from the browser's UI to the network uh, request that it makes uh, to the back end that's providing the search results and then displaying them back to the user. And you know, because there are several layers of testing, it's important that we specify which tier that we're talking about. And so for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be strictly referring to integration testing in the perspective of a front end developer. So yes, you're in the right talk, the server side talk for front end developers. All right, so if you're in the audience, and you're building anything that a browser renders, such as a static website, an e-commerce platform, or of course any web application using any server-side framework like Ruby on Rails, or a modern JavaScript framework like Angular, uh, Angular Ember, or React, that's what I'm referring to when I say integration testing. All right, so now let's get a very important question out of the way. Why do we even need to do integration testing? Well, here's another way to look at it. So let's imagine that we're building a feature together. A common one that we should all be familiar with is a user login system. And let's assume that the upper and lower bounds, or the goal, po the goal posts of this feature, is to provide a web page with a text input for the username and password, and upon a successful form submission, we redirect the user to the dashboard. All right, so if we were writing unit tests, you'd first break out this feature into the multiple subsystems that make up the moving parts. Okay, first, we need a way to persist users to enable them to log in. So we need a user model. Uh, and then you probably write the unit test around verifying a username and password or security like salting and hashing or access permissions, whatever. 
And then you probably write unit tests around the login controller, the handling of input parameters, and then ensuring those get passed off to the user model correctly. And uh, finally, after those are done, you probably write maybe a little bit higher level tests around HTTP routing. So you ensure that the actual requests, HTTP requests, go to the right controller and are processed correctly, like a post action. And that auto redirects happen as we'd expect. Now, these tests are all great, and they are fairly straightforward. You know, at the end, hopefully, you've got all of your units around each system that fit together like little puzzle pieces that fill in all the surface area between the goalposts. And if that were the case, there would be no need for integration tests. However, in reality, there are gaps between each subsystem or component. This is actually what it, what it looks like. And this is where you need integration tests, because you can have 500 unit tests that all pass, but there is still no definitive guarantee that a user will actually be able to log into your application. So the idea here is that we write several integration tests that take us through the points between each component or subsystem. And typically in the web world, that means writing a script that can automate a browser. So in other words, we'd say, okay, visit this page, fill in this form, click the submit button, and we should be redirected to the dashboard, and the dashboard should have some appropriate welcome message. And with these tests in place, we can guarantee that in fact, all the gaps are filled, and we can be confident that our system works without bugs. But this, this is the whole problem. Because when we're writing scripts that automate a browser, we are essentially telling a robot to do the job of a human. And robots have no intuition. They're really stupid. And in reality, getting them to consistently do the right thing as a user would do is perilously difficult. In reality, many of our modern day applications are sufficiently complex and that add an extra dimension of unreliability. Often, between every action and reaction, there is an indeterminate amount of time that you have to factor in. And after spending years of doing integration testing, in my experience, I basically came to the conclusion that integration testing is just too hard. I mean, really, let's be honest. Right? The first mainstream integration tooling came around 2004. And we've had 12 years since then, but it still takes a dedicated staff of QA engineers to do well. But yeah, you know, when I concluded this, I thought maybe this is just one person's opinion. You know, I mean, it was embarrassing to think that maybe there was just something that I was missing that worked for other developers. So I wanted to validate this feeling and see if other people shared these same thoughts. So, you know, is there anyone else out there who feels this way? So what did I do? Well, I asked them. You know, after building up a large list of Backbone Rails subscribers, I leveraged this and I sent out a survey to all the developers that I knew. And I asked them, what are the biggest testing challenges that you want solved? And the world responded. Developers poured in from all companies, sizes, industries, and countries tell me their struggles with testing. And the validation was obvious. Developers all over the world resonate with the same fundamental frustrations as I do. And while I received probably thousands of little snippets like these, I still wanted to understand this better. You know, there seemed to be a lot of noise, and you know, developers do complain a lot, but potentially really clear signals that we could extract. So armed with this data, I sent out to distill these signals down and figure out what it is that needs to be solved and why. And I found that there are three recurring themes that developers find challenging over and over again, and they can be organized into the following. Number one, setup. Every project, every developer has to initially set something up to start testing. This is the first barrier, and it's a large one. Developers struggle to even begin testing, and thus the very first taste they get is a bitter one. Number two, writing. Every project and every developer must, of course, write the tests. But what we find here is that developers want an API that is much easier to write, that performs much faster, and helps them figure out what in the world just, what, uh, just happened when things don't go as planned. And number three, management. So developers struggle to even understand why a test failed. We invest resources into preventing regressions so that when we do see tests fail, we need a clear and direct way of understanding why. What we find here is really the opposite. You've written the tests, but they oftentimes don't help you debug a problem. And why is this the case? 
So let's take a look at each stage in depth. Chapter 1, Setup. Why are developers struggling to even start writing tests? I feel like really the biggest hurdle here is just the sheer number of tools available. I mean, you've got all kinds of different classes of tooling, like runners, reporters, headless browsers, headed browsers. You've got frameworks, you've got libraries, you've got DSLs, you've got services, and just a metric ton of information to sift through. And you, know, you thought we had a lot of JavaScript frameworks for building the front end. There are just as many testing tools. And in fact, even this list is primarily just focused on JavaScript testing tools, except for the psychedelic capybara in the bottom left-hand corner that had to be included. And, and really, that's, that's one of the biggest problems, in my opinion. The testing tools that we use are often even coupled to the language that we write our back end in. And you, you know, you could argue that there was one point in time where that made sense for traditional server-side applications. But with modern JavaScript frameworks available, I mean, this is kind of like an archaic thought. Like, we write our apps in JavaScript, why wouldn't we drive our apps in JavaScript? All right, so another way to look at this problem with setup is by looking at some of the other questions that I asked developers in the survey. For instance, there's clearly an abundance of testing tools, yet when asked a black and white question like, are you currently writing tests for your front end, 25% of developers just answer no. Like, I, I guess I'm not really that surprised, but there's really something to be said here. Even with so many different tools available, there's just one quarter of us that do nothing. Why? You know, when I asked, what are the front end testing tools you're using, I got responses all over the board. I mean, Mocha and Jasmine, the top two, are, are pretty much neck and neck. But really, those are just test runners. Uh, you'll see, like, Selenium is next in line. But typically, you use a library on top of Selenium. And really, there is no clear, ubiquitous tool. Another data point I found really interesting is how important cross-browser testing is to you. And this question, out of all the features I asked about, had the clearest answer. That is, 60% of us say it's an absolute must-have. You have to have cross-browser testing. 35% say it's nice to have. And hardly anyone says that it is not important. But what's striking about this is that when you compare this to the usage of testing services like Sauce Labs or Browser Stack, which can, in fact, automate cross-browsing testing for you, you'll find that it is unlikely that many developers are actually automating cross-browser testing at all. So clearly, everyone is concerned about it, we all want to do it, but for one reason or another, we find it too difficult to automate. And if we're not automating cross-browser testing, I guess that just means that we're doing it manually, or most likely, just ignoring it altogether until someone raises a bug. All right, that was a little digression. Back to chapter two, writing. All right, so you have picked your tools. You have waded through all the configuration and setup, and you are finally ready now to write some tests. So here are some of the challenges that you'll face, because writing a passing test is often much, much, much harder than writing the actual feature. And why? Number one, it's, it's just really murky. Uh, you just can't really see what's going on very well. And developers often compare testing to feeling like you're in a swamp. Like it's hard to see what's going on and understand the correlation between what your code is and what the browser is doing. It just doesn't feel right. It's not normally how we develop. Number two, debugging. Right, so when things go wrong, which is basically every line of code, it's very difficult to pinpoint where the problem occurred. And part of this problem is that when you're using a tool like Selenium, you actually can't even have direct access to dev tools while your tests are running. And when you get stack traces, they often look like this, right? Like, uh, it's probably too small, but we can't find an element via some gross XPath selector, right? So, I mean, yeah, the error is fairly clear. It says, you know, unable to locate element. But why? Why can't you find it? I mean, really, this is oftentimes all you get, right? Like, this is it. Why couldn't you find the element? You have no idea. Number three, speed. So testing on top of Selenium is prohibitively slow. And what I mean by that is that the feedback loop takes so long that you would, in, in practice, never actually write an integration test before building the feature. So you, you know, usually write tests after the feature is done, which defeats the purpose of TDD. I mean, it's, it is possible to use tools uh, which are faster than Selenium, right? Like uh, writing scripts specifically for headless browsers, like PhantomJS. But because PhantomJS is headless, the gains you experience from faster running tests are offset to the time that you will spend 
in debugging it because it's just incredibly much more difficult. Like if you've ever had to take screenshots while developing locally on your own computer to figure out why something failed, then you know how terrible this is. And the last, control. You can't really control things in a browser like you do in a unit test. Like if you're testing a login system, like my example. To test that, you have to go through this incredibly laborious routine before each test, like setting up everything, creating the state in the database, ensuring that all the proper relational data is correct. And this just takes forever. You know, after each test run, you have to reset the state, or else you know you risk the possibility of leaking uh, you know database state between each test. Right? You can't mock. You can't fake anything. The browser does what it does, and you have no control over that. All right. Last, last one, chapter three, management. So let me, let me clarify, what I mean by management is that after you've built up a growing suite of tests, they enter maintenance mode, meaning that they are run over and over again each time new code is pushed. And the problem is, is as these tests run in, in CI or continuous integration, they will inevitably fail. Why? Because of flake and brittleness. So more often than not, you will have a false, a false positive caused by flake. And what is flake? Well, flake is when a test passes locally but fails in continuous integration for no good reason. But in reality, flake actually happens due to a number of very technical reasons. So traditionally, back in the day, you would see that you would see this most often when uh, a network request would fail or one that took longer than you expected and caused a timeout. But the bigger problem that has emerged in the last couple of years is actually flake caused by modern JS frameworks. You see, everything in modern frameworks are async. There are no guarantees when anything is ever done. It is all indeterminate. So you may wire up a click event on a button that removes and then adds a class, but the problem is you have no idea when your framework is finished processing the click. It may add the class immediately, or after three digest cycles, or after making a request, or maybe after a set timeout. You don't ever know. And when you write scripts that are interpreted by a robot, what you'll find is that tests will seemingly randomly fail or flake out. So when dealing with the current testing tools, oftentimes something as simple as a click event may actually even occur at the completely wrong coordinates on the screen, especially if your element is being animated. And that brings us to number two driver bugs. So this is specific to Selenium, but every browser has its own web driver implementation. And the problem here is that different drivers implement the web, the web driver spec in different ways. Does that sound familiar? So, for instance, in the Internet Explorer driver, you sometimes have situations where you issue a click and the driver will not actually click. Literally, will not click for no good reason. And last is, is failure insight, right? So you've just woken up today and you've gotten an email from your CI server reporting that some tests are failing in completely different areas of your application. So this looks bad. So you go investigate what the root cause could be. Who pushed a commit that broke the bill, right? But often you are likely chasing down a false positive, a test that is simply flaky, which seemingly randomly fails. And after spending hours trying to determine what's real versus what is flake, your confidence erodes in your test suite. And this is where we enter the testing death spiral. And even if you can verify that this is a legitimate error or regression, it still takes forever to debug. Literally, this is the stack trace you will get. This is it. So if you're lucky, you've invested time up front maybe to generate screenshots on errors, but even a screenshot does not tell you the preceding conditions which led to that failure. And debugging these problems is a vacuum where time and space cease to exist. And every developer who has done this knows how horrible this is. And in fact, my buddy Sam Saccone, who now works for Google, he tweeted this one day that perfectly sums up managing tests in CI. He says, every time I debug CI, the less I understand how we can possibly land and operate rovers on other planets. All right, I love this tweet, but one of the responses was even better. So Fabian replied, well, I don't think those rovers are running JavaScript. All right, which is probably true, probably true. Okay, all right, 
But it is not just a, a handful of people on small teams with limited resources who find this problematic. So I saw this really great talk at JSConf this year by Dave Catawalader, who works for Walmart Labs. Yes, that Walmart. And they, describe, they discuss their strategy for dealing with testing flake and random failures. And this is literally a slide from his desk, from his deck. He describes dealing with integration testing as shoveling shit as a service. This is his slide. This is his slide, not mine. In fact, the hashtag should be SSAAS. But, all right, all right. Literally, that's, that's what it is, even for Walmart. All right, so the million dollar question is why? Developers are clear what we want. Something that's easy to set up, something that's easy to write, where we can see what's going on and debug our applications. We want, to, we want to know why something is failing, and we also clearly want to be able to run all of our tests across multiple browsers. The problem is that there's essentially one fundamental tool which provides us all this kind of functionality. And surprise, that's Selenium. And virtually all other testing libraries and frameworks are built on top of Selenium. And I think really this is the whole problem, the whole ecosystem. Working with Selenium is difficult to debug, it's slow, and it is susceptible to random test flake and, and failures based on the way its architecture is designed. All right, so about two years ago, I had this crazy, crazy idea. And what if, now just hear me out, what if we just got rid of Selenium? Or at least replaced most of its functionality with something that is built for modern web developers and actually works for us? All right, so the last 18 months, I have spent nearly every day and every night experimenting with this and going way, way, way back in time, as in like reading through browser specs written like a decade or two ago, as in like actually using and learning what a base tag is. And that's right, there, there's a base tag. And all oh, the things that these eyes have seen. Okay. All right, so yes, I know, this is probably the biggest hand wave in slide ever. Because, and I've spent the last 20 slides bitching about how awful integration testing is. But I, really, I just didn't want to rehash all the same information over the next 30 minutes. So I'm just going to cut to the chase and show you what I've been working on. And there's still so much more to do, but hopefully you'll see the direction of this project and understand how this solves the hardest challenges of testing. Of course, yes, it has a name. It's called Cypress. Cypress is truly a next generation framework. It's been built from the ground up to meet the demands of modern developers working with modern frameworks. So this is testing for developers. You just write JavaScript, the natural language of the web. All right, so it's demo time. So I'm gonna take you through a few, uh, through uh, the steps of you know, setting up a new project and getting it running with Cypress. Okay. So let's do this. So um, first thing is, of course, is uh, we have our project, right? So I'm in the uh, to do MVC. We're going to be trying out React to do MVC first. I'm in the project directory. Of course, I already have this installed, but just think of this. This is your project, right? And the first thing that we need to do to test it is to, what do we do? Well, we need to start a server, right? So we'll run npm start. We'll start our server. Now we go to Google Chrome and put in localhost 8888. All right, so here is our wonderful application, to do MVC React, right? So, you know, it works. We've all seen this a million times, right? So now you want to start testing this. This is like, I got my app, how do I start testing? So one of the goals of Cypress is to write your first test in under five minutes. So I'm gonna hit my stopwatch, and we're gonna write our first test for React to do MVC in under five minutes. So what do we need to do? Well. You might be surprised, this is maybe a little bit different, but Cypress itself is actually a desktop application. I have it installed here. So how would you install it? Well, you download from the internet, you, you get a link, but there's also a command line interface tool. And um, the internet was being super flaky here, but this is just an example that you can actually install Cypress by just writing Cypress install. And then it would go out and download Cypress and it would automatically install it for you. So you can still do everything from the command line, you know, even though this is still a desktop application. All right, so that's step one. So we have it installed. And in the Mac version of it, it's just a tray application like this. So I am actually now inside of Cypress. So I'm going to switch over to Sublime Text to show you this is to do MVC. This is our 
This is our, uh, our code that makes this work. And this is inside of Cypress. And although Cypress is a desktop application, you will actually not do anything inside of this. This is just kind of the thing that sits on your computer. Think of it as the replacement for Selenium server. There's no getting around that. But we will do all of our work in the web. So what do we need to do? Well, we just need to add our project, right? Click a little plus button. We've already got to do MVC selected. So we need to add it. We see this come up. And so to start testing, all we do is click on this row, which starts the server. And now we can click on this link, and we're actually inside of Cypress now. OK, so Cypress really wants to run your tests. And it is like, hey, I couldn't find that you had any tests, because this is a brand new project. So of course, we don't have any tests. So let's write our first test. And it's, it's just kind of telling me the path here. OK, let's write our first test. If I come back to my uh, project structure, you'll see that actually uh, Cypress automatically scaffolded out kind of like a suggested uh, pro uh, directory structure for you. It added this Cypress.json, but we don't need to do anything. We literally just, let's just go ahead and write, write our, first, uh, our first file here. So I'll just call this app spec. You can write this in JavaScript, you can write it in CoffeeScript, whatever you want. So we have app spec. I'm just going to stop right there. Let's so flip back to Google Chrome and refresh. And so now, Cypress is able to understand where your test files are, and it's like, hey, we've got this nice app spec. So let, let's go ahead and run this. So we click here, and now we're actually inside of the runner. But it says, hey, sorry, I tried to run this, but I didn't find any tests in here. So let's, let's actually write our first test. And I'm just going to write this, and then we'll talk about this for a second. So we'll, we'll describe to do MVC. We'll write, we'll write a function. Uh, we'll write our first test. So it, it is true. Another, and we'll write expect true to be true. Now, we did not, we did have to install Cypress, but you do not have to do anything else. Cypress automatically comes with all the tooling that you need to write your first test. You don't have to configure anything. There's plenty of those options, but you don't have to do anything initially. So what is this? Well, this kind of looks like a unit test, and that's kind of the point. The point is, it's going to feel a lot like unit tests. And so the describe and the it globals come from Mocha. Mocha is automatically bundled in, and this expect comes from Chai. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to save this, I'm going to flip back, and we have our first passing test in 3 minutes and 12 seconds. OK. So what do we see here? Well, this is the interface. We have the nice suite. That was the describe. We have our first test. And we also have like this first command. It has this one, and it says assert. And this is where things start to get a little crazy. So the first thing is, is that you issue commands in Cypress, and every command is interactive. So for instance, I just clicked on this assert, and I can see what the actual and expected values are in plain English. Of course, this passed. Now, tests will reload in real time. So what do I mean by that is we can come over here and force this to be false. I click Save, and it's refreshed. It's all sub-second refreshes. We come back over here. This error message is pretty clear. I can click on it. I can see these actual values. And I basically know what is going on. OK, let's switch this back to true. Now, the next thing you will notice is that this says, this is your default blank page. Test your web application, do some steps. And that's because Cypress, even though it understands the project structure, it doesn't know anything about where your project is, just like Google Chrome, right? Like when we want to run our project in our browser, we have to navigate to where it's being hosted at. And there's, there's no difference um, in Cypress. So let's, let's actually write a, a for real first test that actually tests this application. So what, what will we do? Well, it can load the app. And uh, we're going to use our first command. So there's also a Psi global automatically available to you. And we're going to use the first visit command. We're going to go out. We're going to visit the same way that we would do in Chrome. We're going to save that. We're going to come back. And you can see it's actually quite a little bit different. So what's different about it? Well, number one is that this is actually our application. And if you notice, this is a real application. Like I can interact with it the same way as I would if this had a separate tab. I can inspect the elements. I mean, there, there is no different. This is your application over here. I can work with this. I can change uh, whatever I want to change. Change to do's, change the DOM, whatever. I mean, this is, this is every, everyone, everyone should be able to understand this. Um, the second thing is you'll notice is that actually when I, when I like pop open my uh, dev tools, the application itself will automatically scale. And that insulates Cypress um, from accidentally failing in different resolutions. The application has no idea this is happening, but Cypress will automatically scale it because it, auto it will automatically calculate everything like a real user. You know, there's, no, there's nothing like fake going on here. All right. 
So that's not really that interesting. Uh, what's interesting here is that we actually have, let me go ahead and zoom in, is we have kind of like what look like two commands. And, um, and if I go ahead and just hover over visit, you'll notice something happens. So what happened? Well, it says DOM snapshot at the bottom. What this is telling you is this is actually telling you this was the state that your application was in when this command completed. And you know, it looks different. Like when we hover off of it, we can see the for real to do MVC, but when we hover over it, we see it. Well, this is what I mean. Like, this is how your app looked to a robot. And why? Well, because React is asynchronous. Why? Because even though its load event occurs, you know, it goes out and loads all the templates asynchronously, it fires up the routing, it's all, it's all asynchronous. It feels instantaneous to us, but it is not to a robot. It's very important. The second thing you'll see over here is that this is not actually a command that we issue. So Cypress is inside of your page, it's inside your app. It is not like Selenium where it is remotely executing commands. It is inside, it knows everything that is going on. And one of the things it does is it reports to you really interesting and important feedback that you should probably care about, such as when the URL changes, or when there's a form submission, or when you're navigating to a new page, or when you're making an AJAX request. And we can help use this to sort of visually understand the order of events that have happened because they're all indeterminate and essentially random. There is one last important thing that you should notice. And if you focus on this URL, we can see that currently it is at that hashtag forward slash. And when we hover over visit, it will actually restore the state of the URL to what it was when it ran. Okay, pretty cool. One last thing, just like all commands, you can click and get additional information. So Cypress can even tell you what changed the URL. In this case, this is a hash change event and this happened from, um, from React itself. Just, just a little, little FYI. All right, so you notice that we haven't written our first assertion yet. and. So let me just show you this. So what happens if we just visit something that doesn't exist? Let me save that and come back. And it's basically every command can implicitly fail in some way. Visit can implicitly fail, and it, we just did because there's not a remote page. So we get this nice error. Cypress error cannot load the remote page. Okay. All right, cool. But let's actually like write our first assertion. So what should our first assertion be? Uh, I mean, we'll keep it simple. Um, probably just query for this h1 and ensure that it contains the content to do's, right? That, sound, that sounds reasonable. Um, so what do we do? Well, we use some new commands. And uh, so let's just go out and query for the h1 and let's write our first assertion. So the h1 should, what should it do? It should contain to do's. So let's do this in this, this past. And uh, there's a lot, lot, of, lot of interesting stuff that just happened. So the first is that, just like all commands, you can interact with these. And when commands are coupled to an element, they will show, they will highlight the element in the exact same way that Chrome highlights it when you're in your dev tools. So for instance, it found this H1. We can see that it's highlighted. Uh, the assertion is coupled to the, uh, the element, so it also highlights. Um, and what's also interesting here is that, I mean, look at, we just kind of learned something, right? Like, we actually started our querying before the new URL changed. And as we run these tests, this is going to be random. Why? Because it's all indeterminate. React will do this when it is ready to do it, and it is completely separate from our testing suite. But everything in Cypress has this in mind, and it is baked in to prevent this kind of flake. It's just interesting that you know we can kind of see this happen. In fact, if we just run all of our tests, it will most likely change if I just hard refresh. At one point, it will probably flip around, and the new URL will actually happen before the others. All right. Um, two other things. Of course, get, when we click on it, it kind of gives us a little bit different information. For instance, this is the actual element that it returned. How many were there? There was one. This was the selector. And same thing for assert. Assert, we can kind of see the actual message, expected H1 to contain to-dos. We can see the actual subject. And of course, we can interact with this. We can review one of their elements panel. We can go straight there. I mean, doesn't this feel a lot like development? Because it is. There's no difference. There's no context switch. You are just in your development environment the whole time. Okay, cool. So we've seen what it looks like when things go well. Um, but what happens if they don't? So let's just say this contains something that it doesn't contain. Let's save that and come back. And you will see that the get and the assert are kind of are kind of like in tandem. They're, they're, they're in that pending state. They're trying to resolve. And so what's happening is that Cypress is basically like, okay, 
what it does is that it looks at commands and it automatically looks at their assertions and it essentially figures out what you're trying to do. It will, it will literally, as it resolves commands, look downstream at things that are going to be happening later and figure out what, what, essentially what is the best algorithm to use to try to figure out what you want the developer. And it will retry this by default, it will retry this for four seconds. You can configure that on a specific command or globally or whatever you want. But when things don't go right, it's really easy to understand this. Of course, I can still interact with them. I can still see See that this is the H1, um, and I get this nice error message expected H1 to contain something like that. Okay, and then, and then the actual error message in Cypress, like if our commands were collapsed, we'd see this. It says time battery trying expected H1 to contain that, and it obviously didn't. Okay. And then what happens, what happens if I try to query for an element that doesn't exist? So we've got this H2, and you notice it's trying to query for H2, and let me let me just kind of zoom in a little bit. And uh, we notice a couple a couple different things. We still see that the assertion is actually happening with the git. And like I said, all commands can implicitly fail. So a, a git, which is which queries for uh, DOM elements, will not resolve until it finds that element. But it will also not resolve until it knows that all of the assertions that are coupled to it also pass. So that way, you just can loosely describe the state that you want your application in. And it doesn't matter when it happens, it will not resolve until, until it reaches that state. Okay. Also, we get, we get some other nice information here, like because there were zero elements, we got, it, this, this number will show up anytime it's more than one, uh, or obviously less than one when it's zero. Okay, cool. So, what else? Uh, you know, let, let's just make this quickly pass again. And so far, I've showed you errors with the Cypress commands, but often when you're testing your application, your actual app is going to be throwing errors. So let's kind of look at that. So let me just open up the JS folder, go to util. So this is all React. This has nothing to do with Cypress. And let's just do, you know, something like this, right? And when we go back and we refresh, you will see that Cypress catches this error. It will automatically catch any uncaught errors that hit uh, window.onError. And of course, you know, it gives us this line number, but we can take this one step further uh, because any error you can just interact with, and here's the actual stack trace, and there it is. Uh, I'm there at the actual error. So uh, it's going to make it dead simple when things go wrong for you to figure those out and address them. And notice the other commands didn't run because when we visited the page, the page bombed on load, there was no reason to do anything else. So we know that is where the error occurred. Okay, cool. Um, all right, I guess one other thing to mention, um, you, you might be kind of wondering like, okay, what, what does git do? Um, Git is analogous to jQuery's dollar sign. Uh, the, the entire sizzle engine has been implemented, so anything you could pass through the dollar sign, any kind of crazy CSS selectors, you can pass to Git, and it will just work. It's literally one-to-one. -one. In fact, many of the methods uh, and commands inside of Cypress have been modeled directly after jQuery methods because you're already familiar with them. It's just, it's so straightforward, we don't even really need to explain it. All right, so let's try our second test. And uh, maybe it can add a new to-do. And see how uh, see what happens, right? And I'm actually going to stop right here. And you notice uh, when I run two tests at the same time, it actually collapses all the commands by default because usually you're running a lot. Of course, we can expand them, but generally, when you're writing this stuff, we're, we're going to take advantage of a cool feature. I'm surprised a lot of people don't know about it in Mocha. We can just put an only flag, and this will just run one test. And what's interesting here is that obviously it says no commands were issued, but also if you notice, we're in this test. But it says we're at the default blank page. And the reason is, is because Cypress is automatically going to try to prevent any leakage between your tests. So even though we visited in this first one, we haven't actually done anything in the second one. So okay, well, I, you know, I guess, I guess we could come back here and visit this, but there would be like a lot of duplication. So the next thing that we can take advantage of is Mocha's bef uh, hooks. The, the, and it's got hooks for before, before each, after, and after each. So all we do is throw this visit in a hook, and uh, this will happen for each one. We can get rid of that. And, um, and for the moment, let's just do psi get, get h1, see what happens. Um, so if you look carefully, you'll actually see this is slightly different. Why? Well, because Cypress will automatically group commands for you. It, it understands that the visit happened before each, whereas your regular commands happened in the test. And this is important because although we're focusing here, there is code that's being executed up here. So watch, when we change this for this visit to fail again, we actually get 
this nice message that tells us exactly, oh, it actually failed on the visit, which is for each. So even though our only is here, like our adding to do actually failed, but it failed due to code that was in a slightly different place. So it's just uh, it's just really nice. All right, cool. So let's uh, let's actually create a uh, create a to do. Uh, so what would we need to do? Well, let's interact with this. Let's look at the structure. We got an input class and new to do. All right, so uh, new to do, and what do we want to do? Uh, throw, throw out, what, what do you think we, we do here? Well, we, we just type in it. So do a demo. Then we can use a special key sequence, enter, which is interpolated through the angle, uh, through the uh, uh, handlebars, the curly braces. And, uh, and let's do that, and let's stop there. So we can interact with this, and uh, when we hover over this, once again, the state is restored, like when we hover off, right, like we can see that our to-do was inserted, but when we go back to the git, the state is, is, uh, is restored. And what's really cool about type is that Cypress actually supports named snapshots, multiple snapshots. And you can actually see here that in this one I've programmed the command to actually take two snapshots, one before the type happens and one after. And you look at this and it's just so obvious what has happened, like how the command has mutated the state. And it gets even cooler, because when we click into type, remember, Cypress is in the page, it understands everything that is happening. And we'll do this just really nice things, like for instance, here's a key event table. This is literally every character that we typed. It tells you the which, the, the, the character code essentially, and it even will tell you the events that that character uh, uh, fired and what your app did with it. For instance, like all these different events, like key down, key press, text input, input, and key up were fired for each of these. But it's interesting because when we did the enter, which is the which 13, right, error, it was actually prevented default. Why do you think that is? Well, it's just because React did that, because it was binding to that event and it didn't want to, to do the default action. So uh, you just have an enormous amount of incredibly useful debugging information, even way more than you have just when you're locally developing. And you notice also that there's kind of there's kind of this strange thing going on. So we have like this get and this type, and this type is actually slightly indented. It has a dash. And really, that Cypress is trying to tell you that there is a relationship. There is an order. There is a logic to the way that these commands fit together. And what it's really saying is that this is a parent command. This is this is a child command. That is, a child requires parent first, right? You can't just type into nothing. But of course, you know, it, it tries to make this easy. You know, like if you screw up and just try to like let me just type directly. You know, you can get an error message that's like subject is null. You cannot call type without a subject. Okay, you know, makes sense, makes sense. Um, all right, so we've created a to-do, and now I'm actually just going to do a bunch of different actions because I've got a lot to cover. And I also just want to kind of show you that we can do a lot of things at the same time. And, uh, you know, if we mess up, well, hopefully we'll just use Cypress to kind of figure this out. Um, so you notice, right, we have like this type, and, um, right, you know, I, uh, I can come over here and I can kind of figure out, you know, plan what I'm going to be doing and, you know, from using this application, in fact, even though we restored the DOM and, and did all kinds of crazy stuff, like our application still works. So you can see like here we have this UL class to-do list, right, and we have these LIs, and we can see like, okay, well, for each new to-do, there's, there's an LI that's created. So maybe we'll make this test uh, the same one where we insert a to-do, then we come over and maybe we complete it. So if we inspect this, right, we see this class of toggles, so let's toggle it, right, and then maybe let's come over down here to active, and click that, and what should happen? Well, it should hide the ones that are completed. And it's funny, like, I'm actually just using the app normally, and in fact, there's still these little page events and stuff, like this new URL got logged out, because Cypress is in your page, like, it's telling you all the stuff that, uh, that happens. So let me just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to knock these out, and, and, uh, and, and we can kind of see. So we do this, we type enter, and then we get the URL with a class of to-dos list. And then we drill into that using find, which is analogous to jQuery's find, right? When you have a selector and you want to drill into its content, use find. And we'll say, okay, well, find, it should have length of one. And then after this, we'll continue because uh, should just returns the same subject. So our subject here would be the li. And you can use the commands and debugging tools to figure that out. So now we're going to 
uh, query for the toggle, which is that checkbox, that's a class, right? And we're going to check that. We can use the check method on that. And then we're going to start over and we're going to query on the UL with a class of filters, which is the little UF, UL at the bottom. And we're going to use contains. And what contains does is it changes the subject to the DOM element that contains that text. So we don't have to like query it by its selector or anything. We can just query by its contents. And then we want to click that. So that should filter it out. And then finally, we'll ask what the hash is, because we know like React will change the URL. We'll say, well, the hash should equal active. All right, let's we'll see how we did, right? Oh, uh oh. So what's happening? So I'm getting the little blue spinny. So I was just like trying to resolve this, right? And I know that goes really fast. So let's just rerun it. So it's stuck there. Well, what is that telling me? Well, it's trying to find it. And I get this error message. Oh, time by retrying. I expected to find an element, ul.todos list, but never found it. Well, well, broke. Well, it's obvious. Something, something went wrong. Well, what, what happened? I thought I got this right. So let me go inspect because here I'm at that problem. I don't have to do anything separate. I just go look. Oh, and it's ul class to do list, not to do's list. Okay. All right, we we'll fixed that, and everything worked. And like I said, there's a, there's a lot. And you know, when you first look at this, you're like, geez, there's there's like a lot of commands. What just happened? But when you when you when you want to know, I mean, just just you know, just start over. Like, okay, well, we typed that created this. We got the to do list. We found the li, which essentially returned returned the li, but they displaced the same content. We expected the li to have a length of one and got one. Then we drilled into that and found the toggle, and Oh, there's something new. So we check this, and a check is an action, so there needs to be a before and an after, so we can see that. And you can actually see a little red dot, and what that is, that is actually telling you the hitbox, the exact coordinates that, that event took place. Right? Okay, cool. Very obvious what just happened there. Then we got the ULs. We found the element that contained active. We clicked that. Same thing. We get this nice before and after state, figuring this out, kind of seeing that reaction. That changed the new URL. Then we asked what the hash was, and we expected this, and, and it equaled. Um, so it all just worked. Now, there are, of course, even more ways to do some really crazy debugging. For instance, we can just use the pause command. What do you think the pause does? It actually just pauses it. So now I can actually go through here, and I, I, can, I can actually just step through each individual command. Like, the next one is going to be typed. So now we're going to see this typed. And then, you know, I, I could keep going down to check and stuff, or I could just resume it. Go. So, I mean, you have an enormous amount of tools available to you to just understand what in the world. You should never not be able to figure out what your test just did. Okay. So, um, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of switch gears here. I've got 15 more minutes. I never, ever get past this stuff. I want to show some more uh, crazy features that I never get to do. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop the server and... Um, I'm just going to rename all these tests, and I want to show you, um, I have just a folder here called test back. Uh, these are just the actual complete tests from the example repo. We're going to rename that, not test, it needs to be tests. I could just change the folder in the configuration, but I don't want to do that. And, uh, all right. So, all right, so we're starting our server back up, and let's just go... And, uh, and now we have like all the tests. I, I just kind of wanted to show you this because like, you know, Cypress kind of indi indicates like which test is running. This is pretty typical, like, you know, when you're working on one, one will run, but when you're working on a bunch, um, you can also just like pause, like stop the test from running if you want or, or reload those or whatever. And, uh, and so I, I, I did this because I want to show you just this, this, this feature that I've been working on a long time, and it has to do with cross-browser testing. I never, ever get to demo this. This is super alpha. It's not, it's not quite done. But I envisioned you being able to use Cypress, and then at any moment, from working from within Chrome, working from your own tests and everything, to be able to spin up a browser in the cloud that literally tests against your local files, that you control from the browser. Now, I tested this earlier, and the internet here is really, 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 really crappy. So I just recorded a video of it, but I literally just did this two hours ago. There's nothing, there's no effects in this or anything. So basically to get access to a web browser, you can just come up here and click on, on which one that you want. And um, I'll just show you that this is an actual video of it working. These are the tests that we're looking at right now. I've got this paused. And so basically I just spun up this browser. And when I go back to Chrome, what this is, let me just pause it. This is Chrome 45 in Windows. 
that we spun up. But in the, it's the same. I, I am still in my Chrome. I'm still in my local. Like all of all of the commands over here is exactly what you just saw. I am inside of Chrome, and I just want to show you that the other browser is reacting. Like we just put in only and ran one test. And it just reacted instantly. In fact, we're, we're going to cause a test to fail. So we say it should not be checked. And these are all the, just the normal commands that you will come to love and use every single day of Cypress. And I didn't want cross-browser testing to be any different. I automatically just handle all these things for you. In fact, in here, this is actually an example of, of we're going to cause an error like in our own test code. But when you actually use the cross-browser, it will automatically rewrite, uh, rewrite all the stack traces to where you can actually debug it locally, even in IE, which is which is incredible. Like You will actually be able to debug IE from inside of Chrome. So like, there's just an example. Like This is a browser you know, somewhere on the East Coast, most likely. And we still get all of the errors exactly as if it is running locally, which is, uh, which is really, really uh, pretty amazing. Um, all right, so, and then, you know, we're running all the tests again. And I mean, it's funny, like, the, I don't know if you've ever experienced running uh, browsers in a VM, but it's always like, even though like, it's really cool the first time you're like, oh, I'm running a browser, but you know, because it's, um, it's going over the network and it's really just sending back an image, it's still like crappy to debug them. It's really slow. So I really just wanted it, I was like, you know what, I, I just want you to use your own tools that you're already comfortable with. And when, when, the, the, when the cross browser runs, it's funny, it will like render much slower than like what the actual commands, because I mean, the browser itself is running the tests way out there, and it's running them really, really fast. But there's like this this lag that you know just just the way that it works uh, from showing it to you. So that was that was something that I've wanted to uh, wanted to show for a while. All right, and um, I've got one other one other thing which kind of tailors back to. Um, uh, my my keynotes about really controlling the browser, controlling what happens in the browser, and Cypress is going to enable you to do some some really cool things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add I've got a second project here, Angular Phone Cat. This is just like the canonical Phone Cat example inside of Cypress, uh, inside of uh, Angular. Um, that was weird. All right, there it goes. All right, and um, so I have Angular just running in a tab here. I've got this. I've got. I've got this up, and I just basically just use Cypress to switch tests or switch projects. Right now, I'm in this Angular Phone Cat. So now it's like telling me these are the scenarios. These. This is just what I call that file or whatever. And um, and so you know, uh, if you actually look at uh, the Selenium test, this this came straight from you know the Angular team. They take about 14 to 16 seconds to run. And you know, they take they take about four seconds to run in uh, in Cypress. It, it, probably it's usually usually three to sometimes even ten times faster uh, based on what's going on. Anyway, uh, so I, I just want to pick this this project real quick because this actually highlights some things that to do MVC uh, is just not sophisticated enough to actually do. So I'm going to collapse this, and I, I've already got the test written. And uh, I just want I just want to show you one thing. So. Uh, I get this question a lot about like uh, mobile testing, um, and one of the things I wanted was for you to be able to do responsive testing very easily. So what I'm going to do is before each of these tests, I'm just going to set the viewport to like an iPhone 6. I also put an only on the describe, so it's only going to run the, these three tests. You notice like the viewport is now changed, but of course you know it still scales, right? So like you know it doesn't really matter how how big it is, and, then, and this is the actual this is the viewport, right? And the application just reacts. Um, and we could also set it to uh, to landscape, right? iPhone 6 in landscape, and there it is. You can kind of see it's like slightly, you know, responsive. It just kind of moves the stuff around. It kind of proves that it works. You can also just pass like two two numbers, so like 900 by 600, whatever, right? You know, we, we can change the viewport however, however you want. So this is what you would normally do to do responsive testing. You would have generally a whole describe block that puts it in, in some kind of resolution, and then you run all your tests to make sure things hide or show or do whatever you want. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is a uh, uh, really, really uh, cool feature of Cypress. And I'm just going to focus on uh, just one test. Oop, get rid of that other only. All right. So in this test, it's, it's fairly simple. We're just saying it should list 20 phones, right? So if we go to the test, or actually we'll just use Cypress itself, right? What did we do before each? Well, we visited. Same thing. And then we got, we get the UL class phones, the LI, the descendant, and how many were found? 20. Okay, and then we expected to have a length of 20 and got 20, right? Okay, so there is something else here though. It's very important. What does it say? It says XHR. And of course, just like 
like uh, anything else, like actions or whatever, when XHR is hit, we actually show you the difference. Here's the request. Here's what the DOM looked like when the request came out, and here's what it came back when the response. Because there could be a, a fairly big gap. And of course, I can interact with this, but I, I didn't change anything about this. I'm just simply logging out for you because it's important to know. In fact, I even log out like the initiator stack. What 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 caused it to occur? So like this is inside of Angular. I could put a breakpoint and refresh, and it hits this breakpoint. You can do just you know, it's it's just like development debugging. All right. But there is this feature inside of Cypress. And remember we talked about how like you normally can't really control the world inside of the browser. But in Cypress, you can. And one of the ways that that is manifested, one of the best ways, is that you can actually control all of the network requests that go out. And you know, building a modern framework, you you are most likely being powered by a third-party JSON. And remember we talked about it's a huge pain in the ass to actually like seed the database and sort of set up the state of the world before running your tests. And if you have like a middleman API, what you can do is from your test just control that API. You can control its response, you can control its delay, you can do all kinds of things. You can do it all within your browser without changing a single line of code. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you. So we have this phones.json, uh, that's like what the request is for, right? And so what, what do I need to do? Uh, it's it's super simple. The first thing is I need to start a server, uh, a, a client server. It's just like another another method, and I can configure the server to do whatever I want. And then I need to set up a uh, basically I need to tell Cypress how to route your requests because Cypress isn't making the request. Your app is, but you're going to tell Cypress what you want to do with those requests. So we're going to say route all gets that match this regular expression phones and force the response to just be an empty array. So this is going to cause our test to break. But when we do that. We actually see it says instead of XHR, it actually says XHR stub. Why? Because we have now just stubbed it. We have forced the response to be an array, just an empty array. And of course now our test times out. What, is it, what does it say? It says expected to find that but never found it, right? Even the, so the length didn't really matter, it just didn't exist at all. Right? And I, I can look here and I can even see like, oh, this matched the stubs URL. Um, you know, I can I can see like what the actual response is and, and all that stuff right from here. Um, but it goes much, much, much further. So there's a lot of commands that sort of have, uh, they interact with each other in very typical ways. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to show you there's built-in fixture support inside of Cypress. So I'm actually going to open up the app. And this is the phone's JSON. Usually, you know, if this was a server, it's being dynamically generated. I'm just going to copy that real quick, and I'm going to throw this in our fixtures, which is in our tests. This is in Cypress land. We'll call it phones.json, and we'll paste this. And um, and now I'll actually use a special keyword called fixture colon, and I pass it a path to where that fixture is. So if this was nested, you know, it would just you know look like this or whatever. I can also specify JSON, but I can omit it, and it'll figure it out. So I'm basically just just routing the same thing again, right? And now now it works. But now we have a fixture. Now we can we can go ahead and start changing, manipulating the world. In fact, I mean we can just go back to this, and maybe you know I, I just want to I want to get rid of all this, make it one, change the name. Uh, you know, connect phone, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, and then, you know, come back here, and, you know, now, now, this is, this is, this is what, this was the truth, this is what it actually fetched, and, I mean, you can still see this, like, it's still in the network, network requests, right, so, of course, I need to have this running, but, I mean, here it is, there, there's the phones.json, and this is the, whoops, this is the actual response to it, right, so, there's nothing, it's all really happening. Your app has no idea. And obviously my test is failing because we, we've specified we're supposed to have one element and we get these really nice error messages. Not enough elements found, found one, expected 20. Pretty pretty straightforward with what uh, just happened. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and just change this. Um, so, but wait, there's more. <laughs> okay, so. We have this and like we've started controlling now the responses. And we can start doing some really cool things that actually sort of help illuminate how Cypress works. I'm going to literally use up every single minute that I have. So I am now going to set a delay. I'm going to force this response not to have a delay. I mean, I'm going to force it to delay two seconds. So look at this. You see now the XHR stub, and I'll, I'll keep replaying this, is now basically in this pending state, right? Do you see that? Because I've just forced it to wait two seconds. But if you notice, our test still passes. And this is this is starts to start unlocking like the truth of really what's going on. Like Cypress is just 
basically constantly trying to resolve what has happened and it is very much insulated from a lot of like the flick that we have. So what else can we do? Well, there's something else that's probably more important and this is the lesson that I was trying to teach. And that is that you can do this thing called aliasing. And what we can do is we can actually just kind of give this, this is sort of like a conceptual representation of this route. So we can alias this as maybe like get, get phones, right? And what we can do is, you know, this happened in our before each, but in our test, what we can actually do is kind of explicitly clue Cypress in that we expect something to happen. Because normally, if you think about it, we're not, we're not, we're, what we're doing, what we're testing for here is we're just testing the length. And we have to understand as developers, well, the length should have this. That is because this other request should have gone out, so we're indirectly testing it. But in Cypress, you can actually directly test the correlation, the cause, the causation between these. We can actually explicitly say, wait for a request to match this route and do not move on until it does. So now when we come back to the commands, now do you see how wait, wait is actually being resolved with the XHR stuff. The moment that it sees that it re its response has happened, it moves on and then our assertion comes through. Pretty awesome. Uh, also, because we started a server, we now kind of have this nice little routing table which tells you sort of all the routes that you've given. And you can see like aliases, aliases are like basically built in, like it'll, it will show you, you know, the relationship of all these. And of course, you know, if you pass it the wrong alias, it gives you this really nice error message. Um, Last thing, when you do wait for an XHR, you can actually get access to the XHR. Impossible to do otherwise. There is no way to get access to anything other than changing your code. But in Cypress, if we actually look at this and click on it and say wait, we can actually see that what was returned here from this command was the actual XHR. So now I can, I can, I can hammer on this. I could, I could test that the request JSON match something. And in this case, I'll actually say, well, its URL should equal uh, phones slash phones dot json, right? Because that's actually the request URL. And so when this finally resolves, you can see that it does do that. It's basically just, just drills into the property. In fact, if you're ever confused, what, what does things return? You can just look at this. Well, this returned the XHR. What did its do? Well, its was a property dot URL that was called on this object. And what, it, what did it return? Return a string. And then, you know, we did our assertion on this. And the last thing is, is one of the reasons this is so important is because if I go into Angular and change the controller and I stop it from querying, instead of getting an error about the number of elements found, which really had nothing to do with the problem, that was the side effect, in Cypress I get a completely different error. So it's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting, and it says it timed out retrying, it, the wait timed out waiting for the first response to the route, get phones. No response ever occurred. It probably actually should say no request ever occurred. So in here we have really for the first time where we are directly testing the thing that we care about and not the side effect, not the thing that if everything goes right, it kind of changes the state of our world. Okay, so I guess we, we're for real out of time. So thank you. If you want to ask questions, I guess just just hang out, hang out later. Uh, Cypress is in private beta right now. There's a, like about 50 people that use it every day. You just go on the website, submit, and you know flip a coin, and you might you might get in. No, no, I, we're working with early adopters all the time. We just have this many of them, and uh, we're trying to get through them little by little by little. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's right. working hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really great. That's cool.